Hello everybody, this is Professor Russo again with a little review of some of the things we are going to be covering or we have covered in this module. So as with the previous one, this should help you with your module quiz as well as the assignments here. Keep in mind you should have completed all of the readings before you jump in and write this presentation as this is just an overview summary. So we're going to turn today as we talk about features to some excellent feature journalism. In fact, the most recent winners of the Pulitzer Prize were announced right while we were designing this class. So Washington Post's Eli Saslow won the Pulitzer Prize for his reporting um, in feature area. And we're going to especially look at this story. Um, these are, again, they're linked in your readings as well, but just so that you can see where they are, um, if you'd like to take a little bit more of a look on this one, Right here, it is the anger and heartbreak on bus number 15 story. So let's look at what some of the things are that Saslaw does to make this such a strong feature. Okay, let's look at this feature lead. So we're going to just read this together right here and think about what that means. Suna Karabe touched up her eye makeup in the rearview mirror and leaned against the steering wheel of the bus to say her morning prayers. Please let me be patient. Let me be generous and kind. She walked through the bus to make her final inspection. Floor swept, seats clean, handrails disinfected, gas tank full for another 10 hour shift on the city's busiest commercial road. She drove to her first stop, waited until exactly 5.23 a.m. and opened the doors. Good morning, she said as she greeted the first passenger of the day, a barefoot man carrying a blanket and a pillow. He dropped 29 cents into the fare machine for the $3 ride. That's all I got, he said, and Suna nodded and waved him on board. Happy Friday, she said to the next people in line, including a couple with three plastic garbage bags of belongings and a large, unlaced dog. Service pet, one of the owners says. He grabbed and he fished into his pocket and pulled out a bus pass as the dog jumped onto the dashboard, grabbed a box of Kleenex, and began shredding tissues into the floor. Service animal, Suna asked, are you sure? What did I tell you already, the passenger said. Just drive the damn bus. But what is this story really about? If you continue to read this story, you will soon come to this paragraph that shows you, okay, so this thing is happening to this woman, Suna, it does not sound like a very fun job to have, but what is it really about? It says, a city Suna no longer recognized in the aftermath of the pandemic. The Denver she encountered each day on the bus has been transformed by a new wave of epidemics overwhelming major cities across the country. Homelessness in Denver is up by as much as 50% since the beginning of the pandemic. Violent crime had increased 17% and murders had gone up 47%. Sometimes the property crime had nearly doubled and seizures of fentanyl and methamphetamine had quadrupled in the past year. So what we see right there is the feature story and how that might differ from our inverted pyramid that we learned about with breaking news. Whereas the lead in an inverted pyramid is the five W's and an H and is focused on the order of importance, getting that information out, and the body then continues to move in the order of importance. The alternative structure has a lead that's going to bring us into the action. It's going to use the narrative technique of often focusing on one example that illustrates a larger point. The body focuses on storytelling and the net graph becomes key. In the, this part of the story I just showed you, that would be considered the net graph. Yes, this is a story about one woman on the route, the bus number 15, the bus driver and the struggle she has to go through. But as we see in this net graph, it's really part of a larger story about what's going on in this large American city. And indeed, by extension, as we see here, cities overall, as we face the post-pandemic America. So I want to just review a little tiny bit. We're just going to watch just the first minute of this. This is from your textbook, but just as a grounding point before we go forward.
So you'll see right there, let me give that a pause. You'll see right there that the professor right there is discussing this idea of narrative a lot. So the idea that there is more artistry to this. It is still factual, as he says. You're going to present maybe more facts that might not seem as consequential, but there is that room for creativity and flexibility to get people, as he said, invested in the story following the plot. So when we look at this idea of a nut graph, so I showed you that on the previous page. The nut graph follows the lead. It's a paragraph that connects the lead, the specific example, to the overall story and tells us what the story significance is. I sometimes say to students that um, you can almost look at a nut graph just a tiny bit. It's a little teeny tiny bit like a thesis statement. It's not going to be the same as a thesis statement for an academic paper, but if that's what you're more familiar with, you know, conveying this is the main point that I'm going to do, it can be a helpful way to look at it. So some other strategic features for writing are using literary devices. So creating a sound, imagery and sensory details. What do you see, smell, and hear? Descriptive writing, lots of observation required, and the show don't tell format, which is don't just summarize, tell, but show by using those techniques above. Let's look at how we do this in Saslow's story. So we can see right here in the sensory details, Kent walked outside onto the bus platform, smelled the chemical burn of fentanyl, and followed it through a crowd of about 25 homeless people to a woman who's smoking, pacing, and gesticulating at an imaginary audience. So we've got that very vivid description of what this um, homeless encampment is like. Then we've got this show don't tell about the frustration that our bus driver, who has, you know, as we saw from the lead, she's trying to maintain patience with what she recognizes are people that are experiencing extreme problems, but she's struggling. Hey, do you speak English? The passenger yelled, get your ass moving or get back to Mexico. She kneaded her hands into the steering wheel. She counted her breasts as they approached the next stop, North Yosemite Street, which had been the site of another episode of violence captured on security cameras several months earlier. So we're leading that reader through the steps. So a journalist there is going to have to have been on that bus for a long time, listen to what these people scream, watched very carefully the bus driver as she's trying, he or she, the, the journalist, they are trying to um, get that story, bring the reader into that story. So before you start this writing, though, an important place is going to be gathering information for your feature, and that's some of the work you'll be doing in Module 2. So the first part of any story is gathering your sources, which means the people and places where you need to get information. Gathering the facts is the most essential part of reporting. As I had an editor once say, you cannot write your way out of bad reporting. <laughs> and all types of stories, news, features, and opinion pieces do depend on this. So one type of source is going to be the human sources. So the person whom an event actually happened to, eyewitnesses, people who saw it, or experts. So you know, examples like, say, you're doing a crime story, the victim in a crash. The eyewitness might be the person who saw it, and a expert might be somebody like a public safety expert talking about you know, the increase in these types of distracted driving deaths. Other sources might not be actually people. They could include the news library or organization. Most large news organizations do have a, their own library of everything they've written on a story. Other reputable news sources, search engines, Yes, they can be reputable. You just have to make sure that you are looking at where that source is. And certainly government websites, things like the Census Bureau, the CIA, Factbook, and local government websites. But a big part of gathering information, one we're going to talk a lot about in this feature one, is just being there. Feature writers often spend ample time in a place and or with people they are focusing on so they can get all those sensory details we discussed. If you reread the story of the number 15 bus, one of the Pulitzer Prize winning ones, you'll see that that gentleman, although he's talking about one day's bus route um, in particular, how much time he must have spent on that bus route, around that bus route with that driver to understand all the things that he did to convey that accurate picture of despair and frustration. So as you approach these sources, an important thing that you're going to need to do is interviewing. And here I turn to the writing fabulous features part of your reading, which talks about how much work we have to do before we even ask that first question. Other things that we want to take away from this is that when we start reporting this idea that we want to research first, and then once we have an idea of the background of the story, then we can begin to determine who we're going to ask and write down our question and answers. Keeping questions open-ended is very important as well. So closed-ended questions are things that are yes or, um, or no or something else like that. 
open-ended questions, um, they let people extrapolate a lot, like how did something feel? And of course, as you are writing, beware of those leading questions where you're trying to drag your reader to a certain answer. Finally, I want to talk briefly about copy editing and um, what we're going to be doing with that. So you're going to be copy editing your own stories and working with your classmates to do copy editing. In this class, we're going to use the AP Style Guide. This is linked here and it is also in your readings. As you take a look at that brief AP Style Guide provided to us, this is a condensed version, not the professional one that most journals would keep, but how does it differ than academic writing? So for instance, look at how they do sourcing. It's not parentheticals. Um, how do they show where they got their information? Um, and then I want to also talk about correctness. That is grammatical correctness, but that is much less of a part than something like fact checking. Indeed, very large or news organizations will have two separate parts, a copy editing part and separate fact checkers. In smaller organizations, those two things might be ruled together. Um, provided in your readings for this week is a list from the City University of New York's Graduate School of Journalism that talks about fact checking is confirming the truth of any verifiable information. So it is having a second pair of eyes, look at a story and make sure that everything that is there is correct. I mean, that's something you can do to your own stories, but it's also something that we will practice doing with each other's work. And then looking at headlines. These are often a copy editor's role as well. Although again, depending on the size of the news organization, you might have somebody that just focuses only on these. So for headlines, what you are trying to do is you're trying to give the most general overall focus or summary of the story. You want to use strong active verbs. Um, to be verbs are generally understood not written out. So I give an example right here, Cain Victor in Virginia race instead of Cain is Victor in Virginia race. And they do need to be a complete thought, a sentence. You can use a secondary headline like a subhead to convey the additional idea of the story. Headlines to avoid grammar errors. You still want it to be a sentence. There, no verb means no real headline. And you don't want to mislead the reader about the content of the article. So down, avoid downplay, exaggeration, or any sensationalism. And I've got some Fun headlines collected from a whole bunch of newspapers all over the place where you can see people taking some fun story ideas and turning these into headlines. But you can see how each of these is indeed a complete, if short, sentence. So again, this presentation will be available for you to take a look at. And I welcome you to do that as you are preparing both your quiz and your assignments this week.